Great. Great. Okay, excellent. Um, right, so um, we're here to welcome uh, Dr. Jacob Doherty. Um, he's a lecturer in anthropology of development at the University of Edinburgh. And his research focuses on urban and environmental anthropology with a particular emphasis on issues of economic inequality and environmental justice in African cities. Um, he's conducted ethnographic research in Uganda, the Ivory Coast and the United States, exploring the everyday infrastructures that urban re residents rely on for their livelihoods, particularly in the areas of waste management and mobility. Um, prior to joining the University of Edinburgh, um, He's held teaching and research positions at um, a few universities in the States, uh, including Wesleyan and UPenn. And also he has been here at the TSU uh, in Oxford. And um, he was when he was here in 2018-19, uh, um, he was working on the Peak Urban Program, uh, which focused on the dynamics of urban transformation, the everyday life of infrastructures, and the formation of political authority. And um, I believe that he's going to be discussing uh, some of uh, that work here today. So um, without further ado, if everyone's, yeah, I think we're good to go. So um, about 40, 45 minutes and then time for discussion. Sure. Thanks so much. Great. Uh, thank you all for being here and thanks for the invitation to uh, to join and share some work with you today. It's um, yeah, it's really a pleasure. TSU was a big part of my own kind of intellectual trajectory, so I'm really pleased to be back and yeah, see everyone again and uh, take part in the celebration of TSU's 50th anniversary birthday. Um, and yeah, as um, as was just said, most of what I'll present today is some stuff that I actually learned during my time spent at TSU, either from the research that I did as part of the Peak Urban Project or from discussions with many of you um, or things that you know uh, I was taught by people working here quite directly so this might be somewhat familiar to some of you but hopefully there's something uh, something in there for something new in there as well so I was asked to present about um, what I'd consider to be some of the most significant questions in my field um, which today I'll think about as critical African urban studies or urban anthropology more broadly. So I think in light of the climate crisis and related challenges of air pollution, along with chronic problems like uh, traffic fatalities, road congestion, excessive time spent in traffic for urban populations, um, things like that that limit the accessibility of urban amenities and the productivity of the urban economy, one of the kind of obvious ways to pose this question is about decarbonization. So a question might be something like what opportunities exist to transform African urban transport systems in order to avoid some of the path dependencies. Um, Sorry, I don't oh, think that's being shared. I'll share the screen. Should work. Yeah. So you can see it now. I think that that means that we can see it. Great. Thanks. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, so one of the kind of obvious ways to enter into this this question in, to enter into this would be a question about decarbonization. So something like what opportunities exist to transform African urban transport systems to avoid the path dependencies associated with un uncontrolled automobility to provide sustainable and accessible transport options for the majority low-income urban population and transition towards clean and zero emissions forms of mass mobility. But inspired by Tim and other people's work on transport justice, I'd kind of complicate this framing a little bit to recognize that this is a transition that's taking place in the context of urban spatial inequality and injustice and that the process of transport planning themselves can serve to either reproduce or to challenge these dynamics, either empowering or further marginalizing urban communities along lines of gender, class and occupation, race and ethnicity, uh, age and ability. So with an exclusive focus on decarbonization, the kind of technocratic gaze of urban planning 
in other words, risks reproducing uh, the coloniality of urban development policies that tend to cast or that often cast the urban population itself as something of a problem in need of upgrading. So in a way, the big problematic at the center of this work is about how to combine and to reconcile these two quite urgent, radical uh, and intertwined agendas of decarbonization and decolonization. So to grapple with this, I propose starting with a slightly more modest kind of empirical question, which uh, is who moves African urbanisms? And argue that attending to the extent, the actually existing practices, technologies, infrastructures and relations that sustain popular mobilities is vital for answering this, this bigger question. So understanding the opportunities, the affordances, as well as the challenges and the limitations of popular mobilities and the perspectives of those who both work in these systems and use them on an everyday basis forces us to rethink what counts as infrastructure, who counts as urban infrastructure. And I'll come on to what this means at the more theoretical level for understanding geographies of care and uh, urban, what, what this might contribute to critical urban studies more broadly in the final section of the presentation. So my thinking about and response to these questions is rooted in an ethnographic case study of Abidjan, which is the largest city in the Ivory Coast. Uh, and it's the westernmost end of a multinational West African megacity region that stretches from Abidjan in the west, yeah, th yeah, through uh, through Ghana, Benin, Togo, uh, to Lagos in Nigeria. Um, that's kind of an area that's kind of being reconstituted through mega infrastructure projects as a kind of vast city region, as a transport corridor. Um, and sort of a, a, a cross-border form of uh, integration through highways and other kinds of transport infrastructure. And Abidjan is a useful place to think about some of these questions for a variety of reasons. Uh, one being that there's a kind of pending and ongoing overhaul of the urban transport system in the city taking place, as uh, I'll detail in a little bit, but there's a big uh, huge billions of pounds investment in a new train, a um, uh, metro rail system and a bus rapid transit system, as well as lots of highway construction, all with the aim of decongesting and transitioning the city towards mass public transport. It's also an, an interesting case study because of the large footprint and large population, meaning that there's a lot of quite large distances involved and there's a lot of diversity of mobilities involved. Uh, the urban amenities are quite uh, spatially segregated as a result of the colonial legacy of planning in the city. And it's also interesting as a case study because of the diversity of forms of uh, mobility systems in place, which include a public, a public system of buses and ferries across the lagoons, um, as well as a kind of a quite diverse set of uh, so-called informal transport systems, including Baka minibuses, uh, communal taxis, which are called uh, warra warras or shared taxis, um, which operate in a variety of different ways, and a kind of emergent sector that uh, I studied with a colleague from the University of Kokodi of auto rickshaws or three wheel three wheels. Uh, interestingly, like no motorcycle taxis, if that's something that you're expecting from uh, African urban transport studies, uh, they've been very strictly controlled and not allowed to flourish, uh, not allowed to come into being in in Abidjan. So popular transport in Abidjan has its roots in the semi, in the, in the segregated colonial city of the early 20th century, where it emerged in tandem with uh, mega infrastructure projects, particularly the opening of the Vridi Canal and the development of the Port Autonome d'Abidjan uh, in the 1930s. And these developed made, developments made Abidjan a major coastal entrepot that was connected by rail to the hinterlands, to the to the internal um, parts of the Ivory Coast colony, uh, where cash crop production and mineral extraction were, were taking place. So at this at this point time, small uh, and independently operated lorries and vans emerged as a way of moving African workers to the port to work uh, on the south side of the lagoon from the popular neighborhood of Ajene in the north of the city, which was a designated African commune 
uh, on the other side of the city from the French uh, from the French dominated plateau region, the commercial center. So this kind of growing nascent independent transport industry lost its license to operate at the moment of independence when a parastatal urban transport company called Sotra was established and given a grant. They were granted a state monopoly on um, to operate bus services in the city. They imported a fleet of uh, vehicles to serve the city and formalized the provision of transport in the 1960s and 70s. An official racial segregation of the city ended at the end of the colonial era, but the legacies of this persist, particularly in um, urban planning policies that continue to emphasize the functional specialization and segregation of space, meaning that there's often quite large distances separating industrial zones from popular residential neighborhoods, which requires workers to cross large distances of the city through these quite long daily commutes. The, the parastatal company Sotra, their services collapsed during the economic crisis and period of structural adjustment policies in the 1980s under IMF reforms, which slashed budgets for urban services uh, and parastatal enterprises. So the number of buses in the public fleet collapsed and the regularity of services fell and vast proportions of the network were simply abandoned. This was a moment at the time of the city's population actually increasing and the city's territorial spread increasing at the same time. So this was the, this was a moment where um, the pop, yeah because of all this the population's mobility needs weren't decreasing, and so this was the era which saw the resurgence of popular transport, first through minibuses known as uh, bakas, which reemerged plying kind of medium and long distance routes in between communes, and then. Um, following that, there was emergence of a five-seater sedan known as the communal taxi or Waro Waro, which developed providing a flexible collective transport service within the boundaries of each commune. So Abidjan has 10, 10 communes of varying sizes. Two of them are extremely large. A few of them are quite small, uh, but they all have a designated color for the taxis that, and they're, they're quite well regulated uh, operating within specific territorial boundaries. And this was a system that emerged um, according to one narrative just as a, as a sort of outcome of passing of uh, drivers who had uh, who had space in a car commuting, stopping to pick passengers up in a kind of hitchhiking mode, and then it kind of emerged into people who weren't doing it to commute, but just sort of using the cars as a form of investment, as a form of business, moving people around in this era when the public bus service uh, was collapsing. So these industries have evolved over time and articulated with changing government structures, changes in the patronage regime uh, that, that dominate the city, the, the politics of the city kind of transformed over the last uh, 20 or 30 years after civil wars kind of and, and radical changes in who was governing the country. Um, there's been ev ev evolution in changing forms of labor organization in the kinds of licit official state taxation and the illicit taxation uh, that transport mafias and organized crime exert over this sector, as well as changes in policing that have uh, shaped where these kinds of, uh, uh, where these kind of vehicles can operate, what kinds of services they can provide. So they're subject to what the economic anthropologist Janet Waitman calls a proliferation of regulatory authorities. So there's multiple kinds of people exerting their authority over this sector, uh, ranging from communal governments, the city government, national governments, national transport unions, small scale local gangs, um, and all sorts of people are kind of exerting the power to regulate and control this industry. But today they form the backbone of mass mobility in the city, and they account for the vast majority of motorized um, motorized miles traveled every day in a context of continuing low levels of private car ownership uh, and entrenched spatial segregation. So you can uh, you, sorry, spatial specialization. So you can see on this graph, walking remains the kind of most significant form of um, everyday transport, but in terms of motorized forms, back of minibuses and Warra Warra communal taxis far outstrip uh, any other kind of way of getting around town uh, using a motorized source. That's about 10 year old data, but I don't 
I haven't seen anything that super updates that particularly radically. So the dominant way of understanding of describing popular transport infrastructures like these in academic and in planning literature is through the concept of informality. And this term often offers a kind of ready made diagnostic of the ills of urban mobility systems, locating the roots of chronic problems like congestion, long commutes, air pollution, traffic accidents, um, and uneven levels of service in the nature of the services provided by the popular transport sector. But the concept of informality is itself highly fraught. This is partly why I'm using the term popular mobilities instead. Um, it's hi highly fraught in part because of the ways it echoes certain colonial tropes through which Europeans encountered and pathologized West African environments as being sensorily overwhelming, both um, excessively fecund yet somehow unproductive. Um, and this really interesting work on the environmental humanities about this kind of encounter of uh, Europeans with the Afri West African nature, West African environment, which was encountered as this dense jungle of excess, but also a lack of useful productive activity. And I think this, this is kind of echoed in the ways that the term informality is used to describe urban environments and urban infrastructures. In part, this is because the term is structured in opposition to formal life. Informality construes African life primarily in terms of what it lacks. In this case, it's failure to conform to the strictures of kind of Weberian rational bureaucratic planning and homogenizes the term in, the term in turn homogenizes the kind of the massive diversity of popular modes of mobility into this single flat category. The term is also limited because of the ways it obscures the existence of form, order, and organization in the popular sector. So as I mentioned, these are systems that are subject to multiple and competing forms of regulation and authority rather than a vacuum of authority. Um, and other transport re researchers have made really uh, significant efforts to redress some of these kind of biases um, in the term. In, in efforts to render informal transport systems legible through the aesthetics of modernist transport planning, as we can see in this map from Nairobi, which is an attempt to kind of map the minibus network of uh, Nairobi and this similar kind of mapping projects underway across uh, across urban Africa. To kind of render visible the systemness of, of these so called informal systems. But the coloniality of informality is not just as a kind of analytic simplification. I think what's important to, to think about is also the way it has this performative force in terms of guiding where resources flow into the city, what forms of work and what forms of life are recognized as contributing to urban development and what kind of and the ways that it underpins disinvestment in popular infrastructure and working conditions. So it's not just a kind of neutral analytic term but it's part of a colonial way of apprehending African urban space that contributes to the displacement and ultimately the disposability of the practices, the people, and the infrastructures that it purports to simply describe. So I think part of the kind of uh, reconciling decarbonization and uh, decolonial perspectives on this is kind of overcoming some of these biases that come with the concept of informality, recognizing the value that these systems provide. And I'm not sure how much this, this concept of informality helps us to, to do that. So just to talk a little bit about the, the overhaul of transport uh, that's taking place in, in Abidjan at the moment. This, uh, this map is a few years old now, but kind of but, but illustrates a whole series of different investments in the transport system that are taking place at the moment, including the construction of ring roads. It also indicates who's funding these, so you can see a lot of World Bank funding, uh, French development funding, uh, African, African development bank funding going into this. So this is a combination of road construction, uh, like a, a big ring road around the city, the construction of new bridges across lagoons, but most importantly, the kind of two signature projects of this uh, a train line, which is going to occupy the space that had been uh, the, the colonial train line running north and south through the city. Uh, from yeah, from the top of the city all the way down to the airport, which is down yeah down in the south on one of the islands in the lagoon. Um, and then an east-west bus rapid transit system 
that's going to, so they're going to meet somewhere in the middle and kind of create this new axis, uh, quite Euclidean grid, dividing the city into four quadrants and providing big, uh, fast mass transit options on the kind of major north, south, and east, west arteries of the city. There is some role envisioned for the existing popular transport sector in this, particularly uh, for communal taxis, the kind of five-seater, sometimes seven-seater vehicles that currently operate, uh, which are being envisioned as taking on a kind of um, feeder role, bringing people from the from deeper inside the communes to these major arteries. Um, and that's something that the World Bank is particularly involved uh, involved in and, and interested in through through a program of professionalization of the of the sector. There's also policies in place to kind of phase out some of the older vehicles in the popular transport fleet, the minibuses in particular, um, and that's being done through a ban on the import of any new used vehicles into the country, sorry, but any more used vehicles into the country over five years old. So this is essentially cutting off an attempt to cut off the supply of vehicles into this sector, which are cheap secondhand imports. Uh, so by disallowing, making kind of not profitable at all to kind of operate these, they're trying to phase out the existing fleet, which are going to end up elsewhere uh, in, in Ivory Coast, in, in the north, uh, but sort of get them off the streets of Abidjan gradually without having a kind of moment of a ban or anything, but just kind of slowing down the supply. So this new set of transport policies and projects is part of a broader vision of new development in Abidjan that we can see reflected in things like this billboard for new construction project um, that is for an under construction uh, office park and shopping center located uh, at a roadside in the Kokodi commune, one of the wealthier communes in the city, right where the BRT is planned to pass by. So this this billboard and this development is something it's it's happening at a place right by a very busy stop where barkers stop to pick up and unload passengers and where pedestrians are forced uh, to compete with vehicles on the hard shoulder of this very busy uh, fast moving road. So the billboard is announcing this kind of new private commercial project, but I think the public transit infrastructure or the, the kind of transport systems we can see in this image are quite telling of a lot of what's the kind of urban imaginary at stake here. There's this kind of combined public private conjuring of a future for the city. And I think we can see here coming soon, there's this promise um, of an empty street that's free for car circulation, for vehicles. Uh, there's a bus stop just there, but it's something that's empty street with free circulation, private automobility, high speed movement, and it's free from the aesthetic pollution of uh, informal systems. Similarly, this kind of architectural rendering of a roundabout and other kinds of road projects that, that you see kind of in the Ivorian media representing like future future projects like this depict this kind of uncluttered streets, free, free for pure circulation, pure possibility of the open road. And this is just kind of un, like pure transport infrastructure freed from the impediments of actual human mobility. So this is a kind of totally de-peopled de version of infrastructure. Uh, and I'll be talking about the kind of opposite way of understanding infrastructure in a second. So one of the most, the most straightforward answer to the question about who moves African urbanisms is drivers. And the reform of the transport system and the shift towards mass mobility poses some major questions about the livelihoods of the thousands of men, and they're almost exclusively men who work in the sector. So on the one hand, there's this move towards professionalization, which was welcomed actually by many of the drivers uh, that I worked with, um, particularly because it, they saw it perhaps as an occasion to restructure some of the rentier ways of organizing the economy and eliminate some of the transport mafias who control the industry. So it also, however, risks entrenching these actors by creating even more significant and lucrative routes around feeders and around BRT and rail stations, which then become a potential source of conflict and violence. So drivers were quite interested in, in professionalization insofar as it meant things like uh, contracts, more transparent relationships about vehicle, uh, control over vehicles, 
uh, the possibility of getting health insurance and accident insurance for themselves in particular is something highly attractive and having a more kind of stable professional identity in their work was quite attractive. So there's quite a lot of buy-in for this uh, among a lot of the drivers that I was doing, uh, that I met during my research. Um, but nonetheless, this kind of overhaul represents a kind of quite large risk for job loss and consequent exacerbation of inequalities in the city as this kind of quite accessible form of uh, of work uh, di disappears with new mass transit options. So labor is a kind of critical and fairly obvious part of what makes African cities move. And recognizing that the labor that goes into making African cities, into making infrastructural systems work, is an important way of shifting attention away from the kind of overly technical, uh, abstract approach to urban planning. People are a critical component as infrastructure. But in Abdul Malik Simone's kind of original and very generative formulation of this concept of people of in, people as infrastructure, which is now amazingly like two decades old, um, this is a much more broad conception of this than just labor. So he recasts a wide range of uh, forms of social interaction, relationships, and everyday urban practices as themselves vital to the functioning of cities and the making of urban life. So I've been interested in particular of thinking about the production of urban mobilities in this way, and especially thinking about how the intersection of urban mobility, care, and social reproduction can think help us to think about how people as caregivers um, use and become forms of mobility infrastructure. So in this way, attention shifts from transport workers to transport users. And the question I'm interested in is about how transport becomes central to care and to social reproduction and how caring relations enable uh, popular mobilities. So recognizing things as infrastructure, like I've been trying to think about like what's what's at stake in making this kind of analytical move. And it seems that often this is meant as a pathway a, a way of, to identify a pathway towards kind of uh, some, some kind of equitable outcomes by pointing to the ways that our collective social reproduction is already material, is already infrastructural, and, and already has, is deeply peopled. But I think this recognition alone, um, as our own politics over the last couple of years reveals, doesn't necessarily guarantee these kind of people or infrastructures the kind of funding and support that they need to survive or to thrive. So on the contrary, infrastructures are often neglected, abandoned or reframed as assets that can be privatized and financialized. So just calling people as calling people as infrastructure doesn't get, get us very far in terms of actually valuing them. So in the UK, in the midst of the pandemic, the Minister of Health reaffirmed the government's commitment to this idea that care begins first and foremost in the family, then scaling out to the community, and then only tertiarily as a concern for the state. So care as infrastructure here continues to be devolved onto women and underpaid disposable minorities, not despite, but through this kind of tokenistic recognition um, as, as essential work. And I was also struck uh, in, the, in the US when the when Biden's big uh, recovery and infrastructure bill went through, there was a massive, it was like very strange hearing like the president and the transport secretary use these quite like terms that we've been seeing in academic journals about care as infrastructure, about people as infrastructure and hearing this coming, coming from Joe Biden, author of this crime bill or, or Pete Buttigieg, the transport secretary, uh, former McKinsey consultant, right? So it gives kind of pause to like why these are such readily apparent, like, what is what are we saying as as analysts or, or theorists when we sort of deploy this similar similar language? So thinking through this, um, I've been inspired by feminist geographers and medical anthropologists and people in science studies, um, in particular by Sophie Lewis's book Full Surrogacy Now, which revisits some of the classic work of feminist medical anthropology. So I've been trying to think about this. This was a lot of work about the kind of emergence of new reproductive technologies in the 90s, things like IVF, but a whole suite of other kind of new reproductive technologies. And I think this is a useful body of work to draw on to think about the gendered politics of transport systems and urban mobility, 
with the kind of conceptual or, or methodological premise of asking what's revealed if we consider reproduction, um, not at the kind of biological scale, but at the kind of scale of the city and consider the infrastructures, um, consider urban infrastructures in, as themselves as a kind of reproductive technology. So in the 90s, feminist medical anthropologists in particular developed um, really powerful critical anal analyses of the ambivalent politics of these new uh, new reproductive technologies like IVF that on the one hand afforded people a lot more choice and control over the reproductive process, but also subjected them to increased surveillance from the medical establishment. They developed a critique of the ways that medicalization of the body displaces other forms of knowledge and care of the body, as well as exacerbating inequalities in reproductive health along the lines of race, class, uh, nation, and sexuality. But I think what's important about, well, what's interesting about this is that despite building these quite powerful critiques, this isn't a kind of technophobic literature, but one that kind of identified the politics and possibilities of doing reproduction differently that these new technologies introduced, as well as then thinking about the ways that these possibilities were being policed or marginalized through uh, heteronormative medical practice. But most significantly, I think, for, for thinking about infrastructure and care at an urban level is the way that they kind of denaturalized reproduction and the family and made visible the ways that all reproduction is assisted, which I think was kind of a, a key mantra in this kind of uh, reproductive technologies literature, helped us, helping us to understand the kind of unnaturalness, assistedness, and technologically mediated nature of all kinds of reproduction. So this, this helped to make visible the entangled and extended networks of expertise, technology, labor, and matter that go into making life. So yeah, this, this was research that was primarily focused on technological interventions into biological reproduction, right? Conception, gestation, pregnancy, and birth. But I think we can extend these kind of lines of analysis across the broader webs of social reproduction um, in order to map some of the kind of, kind of contradictory forces, uh, material practices, and technical interventions that make up care for care in and for the city. Okay, so let me it's quite abstract. Let me give a couple of examples. So I think one powerful example of this that I found uh, in the work I did with transport users, and, I, and in this work I focused particularly on the way mothers of young children use the transport system. Um, I think one, one of the powerful examples of this is the way that uh, women who move food throughout Abidjan use the city's transport infrastructure. So one person that I met in the course of my research was called Veronique Tra, so pseudonym. Um, and she was a trader who was working at Mayop, also a pseudonym, but Yopugon's biggest market. And she'd been working there for nearly two decades, taking over a stall selling uh, onions and red chilies that her mother had previously operated. So Veronique's work requires her to travel to Ajame, which is a central market uh, right in the center of Abidjan, quite about 40 minutes or so, depending on traffic, away from the center of Yopugon where she works. She had to travel to Ajime twice a week to restock her business. And she was attracted to, to Ajime because of the wide selection of vendors, of cheap wholesale foods that are available there. And Ajime is kind of the hub of the country's uh, transport and agricultural logistics networks. All of the food that comes in from the countryside ends up at these wholesale markets in Ajime. So traders from all around the city go there to, um, yeah, to stock up for the week or for a few days. So it's an important wholesale market, but it's quite a long way from Yopugon. So typically, after arriving at Mayop in the morning, uh, quite early in the morning, she would leave her stall under the care of a neighbor. Um, and then she would leave by Baka, often traveling with a fellow vendor who was heading to the same place. Municipal buses do serve this same route, but she always preferred to take Bakas because of the ways, uh, because they were more comfortable. You never have to stand up as you might do in the early morning on a municipal bus. And Bakas were the only viable option for vendors to move merchandise back from Anjume to Yopugon. Taxis are too expensive. Communal taxis don't cross the communal boundary that would enable them to do that. Um, and the big public buses uh, don't allow for travel with large amounts of goods um, 
Uh, so, so yeah, this was the only way to kind of using a barca to transport the goods herself and her goods back to Yapugan was the only way to kind of make this tight margin work in the business. So because barcas allow vendors to travel with their goods reliably and at an affordable price, they've become an integral part of the commercial logistics networks that keep the city's market stocked, that keep the city's restaurants and roadside kiosks and kitchens provisioned. So these are kind of really vital for moving the kind of one of the final steps of moving food from the countryside into the city's kitchens. Um, and this wasn't just Veronique, lots of, uh, lots of uh, mothers I talked to involved in this kind of business uh, told me about the same kinds of patterns of movement. Um, so these aren't commutes to work, but these are kind of mobility as work itself. And through these practices, informal transport has been reconfigured um, through these practices and the forms of expertise that they depend on, transport becomes a new kind of technology of urban social reproduction. It's how food gets into the, uh, the stomachs of the population ultimately. And it's the basis of the kind of physical replenishment of the bodies of the population. So in other words, traders don't just use urban infrastructure, but the system of provision that they produce through their mobility itself becomes a kind of urban infrastructure or, or an urban reproductive technology. They, they turn transport into a kind of reproductive technology in this sense. This is a complex social technical system that's co-produced by transport workers and users who co-opt and appropriate the transport system to recreate it as the logistical backbone of the city's food system. But thinking back to these kind of pending reforms, the formalization of the transport system puts this technology at risk of being displaced by expert planning knowledges that are dedicated above all, above all to solving the problem of the commuter, how people are going to get vast distances across work to, across the city to get to work. So things like trains and BRTs won't provide the same kind of affordances for moving food, for moving goods. You can't tr travel with kilos and kilos of fish on the BRT. Um, so repurpose and, and the repurposed communal taxis risk eliminating the broader range of routes and services that these provide that help move food around the city. Um, so another example of this that we could think about is um, child uh, uh, children's movements through the city for school. But I think I'm talked for about 40 minutes, so maybe I'll leave it at this and we, I can talk about this example in a little bit more detail uh, if anyone's interested in the questions. But the kind of the, the key point here is thinking about the ways that parents co-opt and use the, the informal transport system in order to uh, get their kids uh, moving across school to save themselves and allow themselves to get to work um, in this kind of uh, school day that has a very long gap in the middle for lunch. That's a, there's a two hour break for lunch that requires people who can't afford this kind of service to uh, to kind of go and collect their kids every day, which makes kind of disrupted uh, work regimes for people uh, who have who have informal jobs and manage childcare at the same time. Um, So yeah, in, in this kind of final, this kind of final example, the transport sector is used to kind of facilitate parents' commutes indirectly, insofar as it's repurposed by parents um, as a kind of reliable uh, way of getting kids to school. So informal transport gets used uh, as part of the everyday routines, productive of family mobilities. And again, here, it's communal taxis get kind of integrated into the daily routines of childcare and social reproduction at this level. So I think together these kind of different examples of mobility infrastructures entanglement with uh, quotidian practices of care reveal not just the importance of informal transport workers for sustainable mobilities beyond, um, yeah, beyond the kind of narrow work home trajectory of the planning imaginary, but they also can help us kind of expand our understanding of reproductive technologies uh, as, as something that happens not just at the biological scale, but at a kind of urban level that reproduces urban life as such. So decentering transport infrastructure as such from definitions of mobility systems highlights the diversity of materials, technologies, relationships and practices that constitute mobility. Again, sorry, this is all probably familiar to everyone in this room. Um, and the mobility infrastructures that underpin social reproduction blend the human and the technical as care work 
and other socially re reproductive practices themselves become vital infrastructures for the construction of popular mobilities themselves. Um, so, so these photos both show kiosks where this food that moves through the transport system then ends up back in these kind of kiosks and roadside markets that drivers use to quickly sustain themselves in between the running shifts um, uh, yeah, in their vehicles. So to reconcile the goals of decarbonization and decolonization, transport planning has to account for the heterogeneity of mobilities in the city and recognize the vital role that existing urban reproductive technologies ranging from popular transport systems to food supply chains to school buses and school lunches play as chains of care in producing and reproducing urban life. So it's not enough just to call these things infrastructure, but also to demand that they get the adequate kind of support, maintenance and collective investment that we can see represented in massive mega infrastructure projects. But think about how um, how that kind of resourcing might be redirected to a broader range of mobilities that go beyond kind of high, uh, high, highly capitalized construction projects as the kind of only way of imagining what investment in urban infrastructure would look like. Uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that and look forward to hearing your thoughts.